Back runners to the Connect Run Club podcast. Excited to be with you and uh, have a unique episode today, but yeah. excited to be here with uh, I don't know. Could I consider my coffee doping? So yeah, maybe we, I'm doping right now. We both were doping this we're, morning. We're very so. doping. This is this is doping number two for me. The caffeine. Uh, so. Yeah, I need to get a, another one. I'm I'm sleepy this morning. Uh, yeah, so we've got a, a fun podcast for you guys this week. This is a good follow up from last week with Mario, who's very anti doping. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to say Mark Johnson is pro doping. No, we're just going to say it's a, an interesting. It's an interesting side of the conversation. It is a very, it's a very different side of the conversation. Very different side. Yeah. So he uh, he came out with a book uh, in July called "Spitting in the Soup" Velo Press. Yep. And we had to figure out what that meant, spitting yep. in the soup. Yep. Uh, and he was describing it basically in the cycling world mm-hmm. that uh, the guys that would come out and like speak against doping, everyone else would be like, "Hey, don't spit in the soup." Yep. Basically, this is what's feeding us. This is mm-hmm. our sponsors, our doctors, everything. Um, but yeah, his. Uh, Would you say your views have changed at all? I don't know that my views have changed, but he he brings an interesting perspective, and I think I see it more because to me the the perspective that he brings is what has uh, what has changed over the years is not cheating. Cheating and doping has always happened. What has changed over the years is our reaction to it, and it's funny that we will see some guy suspended for doping, yet there's a commercial for what he took during the commercial break of what you're right. watching. And many of the things of what these guys take are perfectly legal. Now, some of these guys like Ben Johnson taking what horse steroids or something, obviously not great for you and not legal, but a lot of the other stuff that the athletes are taking are perfectly legal and things that we take on a, on a daily basis. Some of us do. So mm-hmm. a very interesting perspective, but it does, it does shed new light. And I, I think the thing that I walked away from, was just like how I watch the Tour de France. I love watching the I love watching the Tour de France. It did not knowing that there's some guys potentially doping. It didn't change my views and it didn't change how I watched it. I enjoyed it just as much. Didn't change anything. At the end of the day, I think we were just talking in the hallway. Do I do I look at Barry Bonds and think, well, if, if I would have taken steroids, I could have been him? No, obviously not. Right. The same thing. I, there's no matter what I could have done, I could have I could not have done what Lance Armstrong did. No matter what I was on, and I think being able to put it in perspective and realizing why are, why are we so hypocritical with these guys when at the same point. 70% of the population are taking some kind of prescription drugs. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's good. So it's a fun conversation. The book, it, it isn't really like pro-doping. It's no. more kind of telling the history of, of drugs in sports uh, and not just cycling, not just running, but um, kind of all sports back um, through the last like century. So it's uh, it's a real interesting read. Yeah, and he's an interesting guy. We're, we're looking at a guy who's a, a great athlete. He probably wouldn't say that, but uh, anybody who, who competes as a cyclist, a competitive cyclist, finishes an Ironman, surfs. He's a photographer. He's a journalist. Yeah. He, he just just about just does everything. Yeah. So. He, I don't know if he gets into it much in this, but he was actually he, he's written another book, and he was with Team Garmin. Uh, mm-hmm. So the U.S. they were U.S. Yeah, U.S. Yeah, team they were. Uh, for a full year. He was kind of with that team, so he was with the guys. Um, so it's very, very close to this this topic. So definitely. Speaking of being close to a topic, hey, uh, we are as Connect Run Club. We're always looking for we're looking at starting some new chapters and communities throughout the country. So if you have any interest in starting a local chapter, a local running club in your community, be sure to give us a shout out, whether Twitter or email us or, or do something. We'd love to connect with you and uh, get something started in your community. But uh, do you also have a survey that we wanted to talk about? As yeah, well? we got a survey going on still uh, for another probably another week. If you guys go to connectrunclub.com forward slash survey. And you guys can take that. We want to continue to put out episodes that uh, you guys enjoy, whether it's our Q and A's with Trey uh, that come out on Monday, um, or it's these more interview style that come out on Thursday, yeah, Wednesday, yeah, something like that. Thursday. They come out on Thursday. They used to come out on Wednesday. Starting to remember. Uh, so uh, fill that out. Let us know what you guys think, and especially if there's any things you'd want us to change and improve for the future. So connectrunclub.com forward slash survey. And if you guys um, fill that out, you will be entered to win. A, uh, a free coaching session with Trey. There you go. So. And your challenge of the day is somehow in conversation today, you spitting in your soup. Yep. You, hey, don't spit in my soup. 
or just take drugs, but just don't tell us about it. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, let's dive into the interview with uh, Mark Johnson. So again, th- thanks, Mark, for uh, joining us on the uh, podcast today. Excited to talk with you. Uh, I think I mentioned I haven't started the book myself, but kind of doing a little bit of research today. I'm really excited to dig into Spitting in the Soup with uh, author Mark Johnson. So Mark, hey, before we kind of dig into it, would love to get your background a little bit. Uh, you know, as a, a journalist, photographer, uh, cycling yourself, would love to kind of get your background a little bit uh, athletic as well uh so i have been covering cycling since the late 80s both as a writer and a photographer and uh about the same time in the late 80s is is when i got involved uh with riding bikes myself uh both as an amateur cyclist and uh started out in triathlons actually did an ironman distance triathlon in new hampshire in 1989 that's great that is great. So, so what what kind of what kind of led to to start the idea of the bookmark? Well, I spent 2011 traveling with the Garmin Pro Cycling team in Europe and North America, and they're a team that was started by uh, Jonathan Botters, who raced with Lance Armstrong in the U.S. Postal team, and then he quit pro cycling really because he was fed up with the doping, and he went back to the states and created this team with that. Uh, objective of racing at the Tour de France level without doping. And so spending a year with that team sort of provoked my interest in the larger history of doping in sport, which really began, as I found in my research, in the late 1800s with the Mm. birth of professional sports. Doping has always been part of sports. And so I was fascinated about how did this evolution happen where something that's always been a normal part of sport was all of a sudden demonized, and how did that transition take place? What, what did that start off as? What, what, what did doping look like back in the 1800s? So professional sports really began because of the Industrial Revolution. It was, it was once you had enough people in big cities like Milan or New York City and Paris to create a market, for the sales of tickets to football games, soccer games, uh, six-day races on velodromes like in Madison Square Garden. Uh Then you had the potential for people to make a living doing a sport. And that was impossible before the Industrial Revolution because you couldn't make a living as a sports person. Because athletes who are professionals in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s were working-class workers it was really – nobody frowned upon the fact that a six-day racer who was expected to race his bikes for six days around a velodrome was turning to stimulants to do their job. Or a marathon runner was using strychnine, which was a common drug at the time as well, as long as as well as alcohol to do their job. So the same way that you wouldn't frown, up, frown upon a, a miner or a factory worker smoking cigarettes using nicotine to do their job, people didn't frown upon – a professional cyclist using stimulants to do do their job. So it was really from day one. And in fact, in my book, I write about the 1904 Olympics in St. Louis. The winner is a British American runner named Charles Hicks. And after he won, uh, his doctor praised the fact that he had used drugs to help him win the marathon. And, and it wasn't seen as something that was shameful, but it was actually mm. celebrated as wow. This could not have happened if this runner and myself as a doctor had not embraced the available chemistry to help them exceed the boundaries of human performance. We well, you know it's interesting that as as you look back to some, like, just look to baseball, for instance. If you look to like uh, the, the mid '90s with with all of the home runs, you know, you, you hear people now just slam that air. But at the time, I didn't hear anybody complaining. I mean, everyone was excited, and uh, you know, everyone loved seeing the long ball. I'm like, you know, everyone knew something was going on. I mean, it didn't take a rocket science. You could look in the lockers and think something was going on. So that's where it always interests me that it's. Uh, we, we we make a big big deal of it, and and you know cheating is, but it, I think as we talked a few minutes ago, it, it's like this snapshot of where we are. As society is something that we we kind of allow. Yeah, and in fact, I have a chapter where I write about baseball in the '90s and how the the home run battles between Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire, drug fueled as they were, some of them, you know, Mark 
Maguire was using androstenedione, which is a drug that you could buy over the counter at GNC because it was sold as, as a supplement. It was a steroid sold as a supplement. It was yeah. perfectly legal. Um, and in fact, Nike had an ad at that time. You may remember it said the ad went, chicks love the long ball. So they were celebrating <laughs> yeah. the fact that there was this drug fueled home run battle and it was obvious because they guys looked like Popeye. But I think the fact that fans flock to stadiums indicated that what we say about doping in sport is not always backed up by what we do. If it's a good spectacle, Americans don't really care if it's drug fueled or not. And that's something that we tend to forget too. We tend to forget the professional sports. The objective is not necessarily to educate people about how to lead a pure and chemistry free life, but it is to entertain people and make money, particularly with sports like baseball and NFL. And so, you know, the anti-doping project is almost conflates this educational objective with a business that really isn't interested in educating people about how they should lead their everyday lives. Well, yeah. And, and I, I think about even a guy in track like LaShawn Merritt and, and I don't remember exactly. I, I think he got, I think it was extends or something he was using. So it's interesting to, you sit there and, and I, I, my son asked me, he was like, what did he get suspended for? And I'm like, well, he got suspended, suspended for this, which you'll probably see a commercial for it in just a minute, but yeah, he just gets <laughs> suspended for it. But with, you know, I mean, big farmer, we're looking at a, we're looking at a, at over one trillion dollar business here in the United States alone. So, I mean, it's, I would imagine from a, from a trying to, to regulate, from a trying to, to how to do this. I mean, I don't think science can keep up with it. Can they from a, from, you know, trying to prevent athletes from, from doping? No. And, and that's something that, has fa- fascinated me in the in the book is the dichotomy between our embrace of performance enhancing drugs and our celebration of them in America by advertising them on television, mm. whether it be ADHD drugs, performance enhancement drugs for sexual performance, uh, low T drugs, which help us deal with indignities of aging. So sort of we've said as society, performance and life enhancing drugs are really good. And in fact, they're so good that we're going to advertise them to you and your nine-year-old kid while you're watching <laughs> baseball. But on the other hand, we're saying, no, these performance-enhancing drugs are horrible and moral, morally uh, decrepit. And so that conflation of, of our points of view is, is something that really fascinated me. And it makes the project really difficult. In fact, when I spoke to Travis Tigart, who runs the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, and he's the guy who was instrumental in taking down Lance Armstrong – he said one of the things that motivates him to to carry on with his task in the midst of a of a drug fueled drug saturated society is that he feels like sports should be his garden of eden where people can actually go about and do their jobs without having to turn in, turn to drugs but it makes his project that much more difficult when society is saying one thing that's completely different than the expectations that are held to athlete that athletes are held to as we look at back at the history of doping and, and changes over the years, have there been some some uh, some big moments in history that you look at? Like, was it during the Cold War? Were there times before that? Have there been some big changes in your mind of of, of where doping has really propelled itself? Yeah, the Cold War is, is the biggest accelerator of doping that the world's ever seen. And the interesting thing is, at the same time, people started to attitudes started to turn against doping in the 1960s. So roughly 100 years after the beginning of pro sports, the medical community started to question the heavy use of amphetamines in sports like cycling and running, uh, the heavy use of steroids and track and field, because the medical community started to understand that there were some negative uh, outcomes that could come from heavy drug use and they started to understand the addictive risks of amphetamines. But at the same time, as this sort of nascent anti, anti-doping interests and anti-doping bureaucracies were starting to take hold in Europe, it was really in Europe. Uh, France first made doping in, uh, a federal offense in 1965. The United States didn't even create an anti-doping agency until 2000, 35 years later. Wow. Um, so at the same time as this, these concerns started to rise in Europe about doping, 
the Cold War was also brewing. And in East Germany, East Germans had were administering 2 million doses of, of anabolic steroids to their athletes every year. And it was a project to, to suggest to the world that East Germany was a powerful place and that the East German system was great because it was creating Olympic winning athletes. And it, and it worked at the 1976 Montreal Olympics. East Germans and the Russians won over 200 medals and the United States barely cracked 90. So their systematic, it was a Manhattan project for sports. They were applying all of the, the scientific metal, the material scientists, the physiologists, the chemists, the, the pharma, the pharmacists and focusing them on delivering uh, medal winning athletes in the interest of achieving their Cold War objectives. Wow. Uh, it, is it, I, I think the thing that's interesting for me is that it, it makes you suspicious of everybody. And, and that's the, you know, that, that's the really interesting thing. How we, how as, as someone who has enjoyed watching cycling, covering cycling, covering sports, how, how has, has this changed anything for you? I mean, do you, do you look at people suspiciously or do you wonder now, are you able to, to, to enjoy sport and, and, and watching it the way that you, that you always have been? Or what, what's your view of how, like, like how you would watch the Tour de France? Does, does anything change that you know all of this is going on? No, I mean, it certainly doesn't make me suspicious because writing this book helped me understand that cyclists have always doped. Yeah. And so fundamentally <laughs> nothing has changed. It's, yeah. it's not our, our, it's a sort of, it's a historically inaccurate assumption to assume that doping is this new cancer gotcha. that is ruining sport that was used to be pure. But that's not the case. What is new is our condemnatory attitude towards doping mm. yeah. practice that had always been normal. So no, I, I don't, I mean, if anything, I feel sorry for the athletes who are put in a position where they do have to dope to do their jobs, particularly at the elite level. Um, and, you know, the culture is changing slowly in cycling. Will it ever change for good? I don't know. But really what anti-doping is, it's almost a missionary project that is trying to impose a new state of moral and, and physical purity on athletes who never asked to be colonized by these missionaries. Mm. And so it's a, it's a difficult project. It takes time, but it, the understanding the history of doping in sport hasn't changed my admiration for the athletes, particularly at the pro cyclist level. I mean, they are the best cyclists in the world, not because they're taking drugs, but because they have the mental fortitude and the, the natural physical capacity to push themselves to the boundaries of, of human performance and whether or not the drugs doesn't change that fundamental fact. Yeah. You, you, you watch for three weeks in July, like I did. And I admire anybody who can do what they did for three weeks in July. It is absolutely, yeah. absolutely nuts to see what those guys have gone through. The, uh, you know, we, we did an interview uh, not too long ago with Ed Caesar who wrote two hour marathon. And one of the interesting things about that book, which I think is a, a very interesting look into what you're doing as well is he was talking about the, the, the small window. You have so many with the Kenyan athletes and the uh, Ethiopian athletes i mean they are there are so many athletes who are pushing each other they have such a small window in their career to get wins and to make money and to get the endorsements and sponsorships and i would imagine a lot of these elite athletes are kind of looking the same thing i mean what and, and you know you have a real conversation and like hey what i if i knew i had a three-year or four-year five-year window in order to make sponsorships or to to to, to be competitive what would you do in that three to five years? And I would imagine a lot of elite athletes are probably feeling that same thing. What do you think? Yeah. And, and I have a chapter in the book on Charlie Francis, who was Ben Johnson's coach. Ben Johnson was famously busted at the 1988 Olympics in the 100 meter race. And Charlie Francis very quickly came to the assumption in, as early as the 1970s that Unless you're doping, using anabolic steroids as part of your preparation, you're not going to be competitive at the elite world championship or, or Olympic level mm. because the anabolic steroids help you push your training that much further. And that's something that really, you know, when we look at sports today, elite sports is about 
creating a set of conditions where the athlete can focus entirely on increasing their performance. So down to nutrition, sleep, uh, mental preparation, uh, physical therapy, uh, for, for cyclists and other, other sports that are more, uh, materials intensive. You've got material scientists, aerodynamic researchers. So you're creating this huge context. And that, that is something that determines really perfected. And it is today is used throughout elite sports. We take it for granted that you have this set of conditions that nurture the, the athlete. That is a system that was completely de- designed because of the Cold War. And doping was only one part of it. It was a big part of it. Right. But that is one of the outcomes of the Cold War is, is that we take a much more sophisticated approach to uh, sports medicine and sports training than we ever did before. And after, after the Cold War, too, I mean, after the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet states disintegrated, all, all of those German coaches went flying around to the rest of the world, rest of the world like dandelions, spreading their knowledge. Yeah. And that's why we take it for granted today that that's how you train. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I think the most interesting thing that you bring up, and probably the most compelling thing, and I, I don't think I'd really thought about it, but it, it, it is our perception of it. I mean, I, I don't know the number. I've heard, I've heard numbers and I don't know what it is, but the average American, how many prescriptions are that the average American takes per day? And, and I know it's a, a massive amount. So it is, it is very interesting the the difference of the judgment that we use to athletes trying to become better in their profession where, Hey, the average American is typically taking something to concentrate, taking something to sleep, taking something for performance. We're all doing something. So it is, it is a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, kind of that perspective that you bring to it. Yeah. I think amphetamines is, is the best example because amphetamines, when the French government made doping illegal in 1965 they were really focusing on amphetamines because amphetamines were the go-to drug that cyclists were using because it gives you a sense of of a courage there's not a lot of evidence that it actually doesn't improve your performance physically but it gives you the mental conviction that can certainly make a difference between winning and, and losing and amphetamines really worked and that's why football players use them too it's because it gives you a sense of fearlessness and, and courage that's unnatural but when the french government banned amphetamines in 1965 they were really focusing on the 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 coaches and the managers who are administering the drugs and and they felt like the french government needed to step in to protect athletes from exploitation by their employers and by race organizers the organizers of the tour de france french government was saying this this race is so impossible that these athletes have to take drugs to do it we need to protect the athletes from exploitation. That wasn't something that the United States, we're, we're, we tend to be more pragmatic in this country. Look, you want to take drugs, does not hurt anybody else, yeah. and it leads to a good baseball game or football game, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we didn't create an anti-doping agency until 2000. <laughs> well, that is it, – it, it, is that what really needs to happen? Do we just need to protect some of these folks from themselves? And because do we have do we have any idea what long term effect of some of these things are going to do to people? So is that the is that the best thing for anti doping is to protect athletes from long term damage? Well, that's that's one of the premises of the World Anti Doping Agency that the World Anti Doping Code. You know, one of the premises is we need to protect athletes because drugs are potentially harmful. But one of the things I cover in my book is that under a doctor's supervision, they're actually not that harmful and they're not that deadly, particularly compared to a sport like football. So since the 1940s, over a thousand Americans have died playing football Mm. in the United States. And that's from head injuries, heat stroke, and sudden cardiac death. Over a thousand people have died. But we don't have a world anti-football death. (laughs) That's a good point. Even though... Playing football is far more deadly than taking drugs to do sports. But it's because we have a more emotional response to drugs than sports because they're seen as unfair and create an unfair playing field. But to get back to your question about do we know the long-term effects, no. And today amphetamines, Adderall is a drug that's commonly uh, administered to treat attention deficit. 
And today, 6.5% of American kids between the age of 4 and 17 are taking speed to, to address their attention deficit program problems. And one of the things I look at in the book is that this explosion of ADHD drugs is also related to performance enhancement because taking these stimulants helps you focus in school. And when you've got a rambunctious sixth grader who's screwing things up for the teacher and the principal and the other kids who need to get good test scores in order to keep the school's funding, it makes sense to get this kid on drugs so that they can perform better and the entire school can perform better. So it's sort of one of the unexpected outcomes of our increasing focus that started with the No Child Left Behind Act in the two th- early 2000s to try and increase uh, school performance and, and create better educated kids. It created this, this unexpected uh, incentive to get more kids on, on drugs. But we don't know yet what the long-term effects are of giving a kid amphetamine starting from the age of four. Wow. Well, you know, one of the things I'd love for you to elaborate on, I don't remember if I, if I heard you say it or, or read about it, but is, you know, we put so much, uh, whether it is in, uh, team sports or whether even it is in cycling, but, uh, you know, there's so much emphasis and pressure on the winning. Uh, you know, uh, you just look at college athletics, uh, you know, the pressure, you know, at the end of the day, the, the a fan of a college team, they don't really care whether that coach is building great men or not. They want to win and the pressure is there to win. So, you know, I, 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 and I, and, and I think I've heard you say this, that I, I used to think, hey, sport's great because it helps you build character and become a better man. But reality is, for an athlete, the expectation and the pressure is to win, not not to become a man of character, although that could happen. But the pressure is there to truly win, correct? That's especially the case in elite sports, professional sports, and Olympic-level sports. Those effects that you mentioned, you know, building a sense of teamwork, camaraderie, uh, the ability to to commit yourself to a long-term goal, those are all noble and super important, but they aren't the essence of sport. They're conditioning effects of becoming a dedicated sports person. The essence of elite and Olympic and professional sport is to win, like you said, and to push the boundaries, the limits of human performance. Uh, but we've kind of backloaded these these moral requirements and and uh, obligation to teach people to be better people uh, is something that yeah it happens in youth sports but it's not the essence of elite sports and professional yeah. sports the essence of professional sports is to win and make money and of course that creates incentive to, to turn to common pharmaceuticals to help execute that job Particularly when everybody else in society has turned into them, but then they were saying, "Ah, oh, except you athletes, you can't get what we get." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, to me, that's always the humorous part, and it's like, I'm sorry, with a trillion dollar industry, uh, the industry is not going anywhere. No, no way. Hey, what, what is the reaction? <laughs> That, that, that you think athletes give. So, especially from cyclists. So, and, and now I'll just use Lance Armstrong as, as an example. As, as someone like him went through what he did and, and it got hammered for it. And, and other cyclists do and other athletes like a Justin Gatlin or LaShawn Mayer. These, these guys who are getting in trouble. What, what do you, what do you think the reaction is of other athletes? Uh, do they, do they have any remorse, do you think, for these guys? Do they have empathy? Do they like, hey, he just he, he got hammered? I mean, do you know what the re- common reaction, uh, you know, to these athletes who, who get in trouble? Do you know what the kind of common, common reaction is? Well, that's, that reaction is, is where the title of the book comes from, Spitting in the Soup. So it was a French phrase that when in the pro peloton, pro cycling community, when a cyclist was going to say, I'm going to come clean to the press and talk about how dope this sport is and how chemically dependent we are, their colleagues would say, well, why would you spit in the soup? Why would you spit in the soup that feeds all of us? Wow. Not just the athletes, but also the, the team sponsors, the medical doctors, the mechanics. So there's a whole constellation of people who are dependent upon professional cycling. And if somebody said, well, this whole thing's a fraud, they'd say, why would you spit in spit in the soup? So, yeah, I mean, ha- we're still reluctant to address that reality, particularly as a society. It's easier to go criticize Lance Armstrong and say it's a creep rather than look in the mirror and say, look, we're all dependent upon performance <laughs> and anti-drugs too. Yeah. But I think that 
to get back to your question, I think that the athletes' attitudes in some sports is changing. You know, in, in cycling, and it really depends on a cultural change. Even though the approach to anti-doping so far has been more of a law and order, we're going to have stricter penalties. If a cyclist gets busted now, he's out for eight years. Um, you know, pro cyclists have to report their whereabouts 365 days a year. Mm-hmm. They're anti-doping agency, so it's about surveillance, stronger policing. But really what's going to you can you can pluck out dope cyclists all day but the larger cultural and economic forces that are overlooking doping or encouraging doping that's not solving those so i think if you can get to a point where cyclists as a collective or athletes in any sport are condemning the use of of doping then it becomes potentially easier to get rid of it but that doesn't eliminate the long history where people have always turned to pharmaceuticals to increase performance. I mean, we saw a little bit of it in the Olympics this year where the American swimmer criticized the, the um, Soviet swimmer yep. who was on the podium with her. I don't, I don't remember the name off the top of my head. But you know, some criticized the American for being sour grapes because she was criticizing a Soviet athlete who the World Anti-Doping Agency had said pretty much all the Soviet athletes are doped. Um, so that's a, c- a case where peer pressure is setting the stage, saying, look, don't dope. It's not cool, and we don't expect any other people to dope. Fascinating. Uh, again, I'm excited to dig into it, Mark. A hey, quick question, un- undoping related, that I'd love to ask you. Do, do, are there a couple of cyclists out there now, any handful that you really enjoy to watch, keep up with? Uh no, Albert, Alberto Contador, mm, yeah. who's won the Tour de France, he's always super inspiring. Chris Froome, who's a Tour de France winner from United Kingdom. Uh, definitely Peter Sagan from Slovakia. He won the World Championships this year in, in Richmond. Uh, but, you know, I look at cycling almost the same way that I look at musical performance. I mean, I don't condemn the Rolling Stones because Keith Richards has a long and colorful history of using <laughs> drugs. They're still entertaining, and it doesn't take away from the quality of the product. That's the same way I look at the Tour de France. It's still astonishingly astonishingly beautiful from the landscape to the pageantry to the history of the race. And uh, I still get great pleasure out of it. And and the extraordinary uh, successes and and endeavors that those athletes accomplish is mind-blowing. Yeah, it, I'm with you. It, it, it's still compelling. And, uh, you know, and I just give you an example to me, the, the courage it took for some of those athletes at the, at the end of that o- Olympic ride who were th- the downhill to that last portion was just absolutely nuts. And so the, the abandon that those guys went and, you know, falling off the bike, I, you know, to be able to go that hard to me. With you know, it would not regarding your health to me. It's just astounding to watch the courage it takes to go that hard downhill like that. Yeah, and I'm, that's the essence of that level of athletes. Uh, and I think that's also something that the fact that the people who make it as elite Olympic level athletes have a fundamental capacity to downplay risk. Hmm. And when you go about anti-doping saying, oh, you can't take drugs because you're going to kill yourself. Well, for that level of athlete, their natural inclination is to dismiss that because that's what makes them so great is because they can get out there on a football field or uh, on a cycling road race and dismiss the sort of risks that keep the rest of us in our lazy boy chairs. And so adds to complexity to our current approach to anti-doping. That's great. Mark, this has been one of the most compelling conversations I've ever had about doping. Makes me think a lot. And uh, really, yeah, and I, I think given some of the things you said, I can, you, you can allow you to enjoy the sport more by understanding the history and understanding that, hey, where we are in society. So I, I thank you again for spending a few minutes with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on and enjoy the book. We sure will. Thanks again, Mark. You're welcome. All right, goodbye.